Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 148 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Ken Liu, one of science fiction's most popular short story writers. He's also translated many works of Chinese science fiction into English, including the best-selling novel The Three-Body Problem by Lu Cixin. Ken's first novel, The Grace of Kings, is an epic fantasy inspired by Chinese history. And now, here's our interview with Ken Liu. All right, so we're here with Ken Liu. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Okay, so why don't you tell us a bit about how you first got interested in reading fantasy and science fiction? Uh, I remember the first science fiction work I read was the Chinese translation for Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick, um, which turned into Blade Runner later. And I thought that was just such a fascinating, great story. Um, so maybe that can be considered the start. Um, I like Arthur C. Clarke. I like Rosalind Le Guin. Um, just pretty much everybody. And so when did you actually start writing your own fiction? I started submitting for publication, I guess, in college um, and didn't really have much success until much later. And were you submitting to the science fiction magazines at that time? I submitted to all sorts of places, but yeah, including uh, the science fiction magazines I knew at the time. And I didn't really know the industry very well. So I was just submitting to uh, the magazines I'd heard of, like Asimov's and FNSF uh, and Analog. And so then you actually first got published in the Phobos Fiction Contest, right? You want to tell us about that? Uh, sure. Uh, Phobos was a, was a fiction... I think they were, they were a company that started um, to focus on publishing anthologies of short fiction. And I think the idea was they wanted to develop them into media properties. Uh, and so I just submitted to them. And I think I was one of the uh, first winners for their first um, contest. And so that was my debut story um, that got a professional rate. And so when we met the first time, uh, we talked about how I also had two stories in that anthology. And I don't know, did you, were you involved with all the, the stuff with the weird contract for that anthology? I was very peripherally involved only. I mean, I, I remember that the contract they send us at first was really um, not very good, not very writer friendly. And I think um, writers were talking to each other and we said, you know, we can't sign this. We need to get them to offer us better terms. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, for, for people who may not know, I mean, the standard short story contract is like three quarters of a page. It's very straightforward. And this was a 20 page contract. So and it, had, it involved film rights and video game rights and all sorts of things. I mean, I think that they had their heart was in the right place, but they just didn't know what was standard in publishing. Uh, but I can just imagine as a first time, uh, it, you know, this is your first short story being published and getting this 20 page contract. It must have been pretty intimidating. It was interesting. I mean, I didn't know what to think of it, to be honest. I mean, I got the contract and I was like, oh, sure. Um, you know, basically it says we want these rights and we're going to pay you this money. Uh, and I had really no sense of which rights were reasonable to ask for, which were not. Um, so I read it just like any other contract and it, it felt OK to me. It's not until some of the other writers wrote to everybody and said, you know, this is not really um, this doesn't really make sense, uh, that I said, oh, okay. Hmm. Well, and then, so how about what happened after that in terms of short stories? Cause you started selling quite a few short stories after that. Not, not right away for sure. Uh, I mean, after that, I think I had maybe one other sale to, um, writers of the future, uh, and then maybe one sale to strange horizons. Hard to remember. I think that was the chronology. And then, uh, I basically couldn't sell anything at all. Uh, I wrote one particular story, um, called single bit error. Um, and that was really, really cool. I really liked it. Uh, and, and I thought that was the best thing I'd ever written. Uh, but unfortunately, um, I could not get it accepted anywhere. I think I submitted that thing and I got, I'm, I'm sure 30 rejections or something like that. Um, and so I sort of gave up, uh, because I, I got obsessed with that story, um, and I couldn't sell it. Uh, and then I just sort of stopped writing for a few years. Um, it's not until many, many years later um, that Single Bit Error um, finally did get published. And so where did that story appear ultimately? Uh, it appeared in an anthology called Thought Crime Experiments, uh, which is focused on, um, amusingly, uh, stories that had been rejected many times. <laughs> 
Um, but so it, was it then after that that you started really getting on this role with the short fiction? Uh, I, I think after that I started writing more, but I, I'm not sure I started selling that much more either. Um, I, I think it was a couple more years maybe um, before I started selling at a regular clip. I mean, because at this point you've published how, how many stories? Dozens at this point, right? At this point, uh, it's over 100 now, maybe 110, 115. I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's somewhere around there. I know I crossed over the 100 mark sometime last year. Well, and so which of those would you say have been the have uh, gotten the most attention or been the best received by readers? Um, that's hard to say, actually, um, because there are many ways to measure um, this. I mean, for example, um, The Paper Menagerie is a story that won the Nebula Hugo and the World Fantasy Award, and that particular story uh, has been reprinted a lot. So it gets a lot of exposure. Um, but I don't know if that's really the one that readers like the most. I certainly get a lot of positive comments about it from readers, uh, but I, I tend to think that's just a function of the fact that it's being reprinted so many times. Um, the story that I really like, that I thought was the best story, uh, is called The Man Who Ended History, um, and that was a Nebula and Hugo nominee um, for a novella in the same year. Uh, that one did not get nearly as much attention, uh, but I personally think it's probably my best work to date um, in the short fiction category. Yeah, yeah, and I want to mention for listeners that uh, a collection of your short stories will be coming out later this year called The Paper Menagerie. Uh, and other just, stories. Yeah. And other stories. You want to just say a bit about that? Sure. Um, this will be my first English uh, short fiction collection. Um, it's called The Paper Menagerie and Other Stories, and it collects, um, I think, a representative sample of my work from the beginning of my career till now. Um, I think there's a total of um, uh, maybe... 15 stories in there. Um, many of them are award nominees or winners, and a lot of them have been collected in year's best anthologies. Uh, but we, my editor, Joe Mounty, and I weren't interested in sort of producing something called greatest hits. That, that's not what we were interested in. We wanted to pick a sample of stories that we thought represented um, what I was interested in writing and what I liked to write about and what I thought I was good at writing about. Uh, sort of a, a variety sampling pack for people who are not familiar with my short fiction. And there's also a new story in it that I wrote specifically for the collection that's never been published before, which I'm very proud of. So I think readers will, I hope readers will enjoy it. All right, great. But so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about your first novel that's uh, just out, The Grace of Kings. So just uh, how did this uh, book first come about? Uh, the idea came about because I was writing a lot of short fiction, but I wanted to move into writing novels, uh, and I didn't have a good subject in mind, so I was looking through my short stories to see if there's something there that really piqued my interest. And my wife, Lisa Tanglio, who is, um, who grew up in Hong Kong, said, you know, you and I both have, um, these very vivid memories of these historical Chinese dramas based on... Uh, legends and, and facts from Chinese history. Um, so maybe you can do something with that, but, but try to do it in a way that feels true to you. And I thought, you know, that's a really good idea because I, I, do, I do remember those were my favorite stories when I was growing up. So I ended up deciding to pick one of these uh, historical periods, the Chuhan Contention, which is the fall of the Qing Dynasty and the rise of the Han Dynasty. Um, in about 200 or so BC. Um, and I said, you know what, I'm going to take this, this period of history, uh, which is when a lot of heroes uh, were rising up all around China, um, and it was a time of war, a time of great change, time of great social contention. Uh, and I'm going to try to reimagine the story as a um, epic fantasy, a Western epic fantasy. I'm going to try to reimagine the story and create a whole new world with new cultures, new people in it. Um, and so that was how The Grace of Kings came about. Well, so tell us about the, the fantasy world that you created in this novel. Just what are some of the kind of original uh, spins that you put on the story? So um, I want to be clear that I, I didn't set out to write a story that's a magical China story. I think magical China stories are very difficult to do well. And I think... Um, the, the, the very way that China has been described um, in Western narratives and in, in the way that West perceives it makes it hard to tell a story that will escape the stereotypes and allow people to perceive it fresh. So I decided to create a new fantasy world that's based and inspired by East Asia and by China in, in particular. 
but not really um, uh, directly uh, analogous to it. So instead of a continental country, uh, Dara, which is my fantasy world, is a set of islands, an archipelago. And um, Dara is a place of magic as well as of technology. Uh, and the technology aesthetic that I'm going for is what I call silk punk, uh, which is, of course, analogous to steampunk. Steampunk is the, the, the idea of, of extending the Victorian era technology and, and aesthetics to um, alternative paths not taken. And, and so silk punk is one where I take the technology inspirations of classical China, like kites used for military uh, endeavors and for signaling, um, very uh, powerful mechanical uh, vehicles of various sorts. Um, just these, these inventions that are described um, either in real history or in historical romances. And I take them and I sort of blow them up um, and, and turn them um, down an evolutionary path that I think they would have taken uh, if they were allowed to develop. And so this is a world in which there are magical creatures, giant sea beasts, uh, books that can read minds, uh, people who use smoke to read people's hearts, um, as well as uh, technology uh, wonders like battle kites, uh, giant airships that are propelled by oars through the air instead of propellers, um, and uh, even underwater boats. Uh, and all of these are based on uh, either direct East Asian analogs or sort of extensions of what were done. Um, so it's a, it, it's a fun tech fantasy world that I think people will enjoy. Well, so tell us about the, the heroes of this story, because there are sort of two main protagonists, um, Kuni Guru and Mata Zindu. Uh, tell us about them. Uh, so the idea of the two heroes um, is that they are two men of very polar, op they're, they're, they're two men of polar, op they're, they represent polar opposite qualities. Um, Kuni Garu is a commoner um, who really isn't very ambitious at all. He doesn't really care about learning and, and he doesn't really care about um, climbing up the social ladder. He just sort of wants to have fun and do the interesting thing, quote unquote. Um, Mata Zindu, on the other hand, is the descendant uh, of a very important and powerful founding of nobles uh, who have always been great generals in Dara. Um, and at the beginning of the novel, we find out that the islands of Dara, which have been divided into separate kingdoms, um, were forcibly united by one of them. Uh, and, and the new emperor has a very harsh rule in place. And, and so what Mata wants to do is to restore the world to the way it used to be uh, with the separate kingdoms, whereas Kuni um, just wants to see if he can make his own life a little bit better and, and make people he love um, live more interesting and, and happier lives. And so these two unlikely um, protagonists sort of become leaders in a subsequent rebellion against the empire when the empire's rule becomes too harsh. And they get together and, and turn out that they're actually really good friends um, because their strength and weaknesses complement each other. So the story is sort of about their friendship and, and their rise together in the rebellion against the empire until, of course, um, as they near success, they find out that, in fact, there are very different ideals about how the world can be made more just and better are utterly incompatible. Uh, and so there are consequences to that. And so in addition to these two characters we were just talking about, there's a, a lot of other characters in the book, including, I thought, interestingly, a tax collector named Kindu Murana. And I, I believe you have a background as a, a tax attorney of some sort. And I was just wondering uh, to what extent your background uh, played a role in that character and some of the other sort of tax related stuff in the book. Right, right. So I was a tax attorney for something like seven years. So, you know, I, I was a tax geek. I was really into it. Um, tax is one of those things where people think is incredibly boring, but um, like any kind of signs about systems, uh, once you get into it, it becomes incredibly intricate and interesting. Um, because I really, you know, love tax, uh, tax topics actually feature quite a lot in my fiction of various um, lengths. I once wrote a, uh, a science fiction short story um, centered around the idea of an alien tax code uh, and the idea that you can understand the society um, by parsing its tax code. Um, and so 
The Grace of Kings, I think, is, is an epic fantasy um, that's distinguished, uh, among other things, by the fact that it is the most tax-driven epic fantasy of them all. Um, tax plays a large role in the story. Um, so, you know, my, my, my pitch would be that if I can make tax interesting to you, um, the, the, the really fun stuff would be really fun. Um, the, the character of Kinder Morana is um, sort, of a, sort of a joke, but not, not, not exactly. Um, he's a tax collector um, and who turns into a very important general. Uh, and that's actually also based on real history um, in which this sort of thing actually happened. Uh, and so what I wanted to explore in the book is, is what kind of things, uh, what kind of skills are really useful um, when, you're, when you're sort of the chief tax collector for an empire uh, that can play a role in military strategy. And it turns out that there's a lot um, when, when you're very tax-driven and, and look at everything through a tax-colored lens. Um, you begin to think about uh, everything in terms of logistics and planning and systems. Uh, and the military is really... Military strategy is really about systems hacking. So um, I ended up finding a lot of really interesting parallels between the two. Yeah. And I mean, the thing that sticks out in my mind most about the taxes in this book is there's a part where they're having trouble getting people to pay their taxes and they come up with the idea to, to do a lottery. Uh, I thought that was interesting. How did you, like, where did that idea come from? Uh, I'm pretty sure that was actually based on a real tax scheme tried out uh, in one part of China. Um, essentially, the idea is... Um, Small businesses like restaurants uh, tend to have a complicated history with tax authorities. Um, they they tend to engage in various tricks like you know being a cash only business. So they they engage in tricks like keeping two sets of books to um, not report their income accurately. Uh, and so that's essentially what happened in the book here, um, where the the small businesses of the city of Zudi are not willing to pay taxes to their new duke um, because they think he may not be there very long. So um, Cooney comes up with a scheme where, where he holds a lottery uh, for the citizens of, of Zudi, um, but the citizens can't buy lottery tickets directly from, from the government. Instead, um, they get it as a kind of receipt when they purchase um, items from vendors, um, and they get lottery tickets uh, based on the amount they spend. Um, and the vendors, of course, would have to purchase the lottery tickets from the government. So in this way, um, it forces the merchants to be honest because every customer now has an incentive to demand these lottery tickets uh, as a receipt for their spending. And so the vendors can no longer hide their income because they would have to purchase the lottery tickets from the government. So the more they sell, the more they have to purchase and therefore pay in taxes. Um, so it's a very clever way to align the incentives of, of the general populace with the government. Yeah. Uh, so another character that really struck me in this book was Zato Ruthi. Uh, there's actually a really interesting portrayal of, of scholars and intellectuals in this book. But tell us about Zato Ruthi. Uh, just talk about that character. Uh, well, he's a scholar uh, who ends up being king. Uh, through a series of accidents. Uh, and of course, the portrayal of scholars is pretty critical to the book. Um, I think that's maybe another thing that distinguishes this particular epic fantasy from uh, epic fantasy that derives from a more Western European medieval, magical medieval Western Europe kind of tradition. Um, scholarship has always been hugely respected uh, in classical China. Um, and the kind of classical learning that they specialized in was often uh, valorized to a degree that um, learning isn't valorizing medieval Europe. So um, the particular, the story that I, in the Grace of Kings, I wanted to preserve that, that feel. Um, and so this is a society in which scholarship is very much valued and scholarship is a way for you to ascend in the world uh, by uh, being able to serve in the imperial bureaucracy. Uh, and Zada Ruthi is one of these scholars who, um, was, in fact, a brilliant scholar. Um, but he actually uh, didn't want to go through um, and, and serve the imperial bureaucracy. He wanted to go off into the woods all by himself and start contemplating and thinking about how to make the world better. Um, and through sort of a series of accidents, he, he becomes uh, a figurehead for the revolution that was held. Uh, and so he becomes um, uh, uh, the king of one of the Tiro states, um, not because he wanted to be king, but rather just because he was sort of a compromise candidate that all the 
political interests uh, in question could agree on. And of course, um, it turns out that he he was a terrible king uh, because he's just not his his ideas about what is moral and what is the right thing to do are just utterly incompatible with political and military realities. Right. I mean, it was kind of making me think of how Plato thought that the world should be ruled by philosopher kings. And... Exactly. Exactly. And uh, and then I think if you really did implement Plato's um, utopia, that's that's what would happen. <laughs> Yeah, his thoughts are too too much philosophy, not enough uh, pragmatism. Yeah, he he has this idea that you know this is the thing, it, this is the way things ought to be. This is the way the the, the way the world should function. And so I'm just going to go ahead and, and do things as though we live in that world. Uh, we're going to ignore the fact that uh, in this world there are people who are selfish and people who are interested in winning instead of doing quote unquote the right thing. And and that um, you know if if I think. Uh, a certain thing about how men and women should behave, that's the way they ought to behave. Um, and, and so, yeah, it, it turns out to be um, a kind of a disaster. <laughs> and then on the other end of that, getting into the pragmatism, there's this this really interesting scene where Garu, who's uh, just generally a nice guy, but he's, he's come into political power now, now he has to deal with some of these issues. Uh, I mean, there's a scene that's right out of Machiavelli. I don't know if you were uh, intentionally drawing on that or not, but but basically this idea that you have to uh, be brutal before you be kind in order to be accepted by uh, people that you've uh, gained power over. That's right. That's right. Yes, it is very Machiavellian, um, but um, it also has analogs in traditional um, Chinese political writing. Um, and so I was drawing on both traditions in, in writing that scene. Um, it, it's the idea that, you know, as a ruler, you, you can't just um, be generous all the time because then um, people will take you for granted. So the way you, you, you gain the people's gratitude is to actually allow some horrible things to happen to them first before you step in and try to be kind. Uh, you know, it's, 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 very, it's, uh, it's a very important moment in the book when he, when Cooney sort of gets this education and is forced to confront the fact that he will have to do things that are not particularly good or right. Um, if he wants to preserve power, uh, and then uh, the book becomes a fairly complicated, um, um, uh, uh, follows his complicated process in coming to terms with that um, as he gains more and more power and, and has to behave in more and more ambivalent ways. And I think there's a line that really captures that that struck me as uh, he says, I think I wield power, but perhaps it is power that wields me. Exactly. Yes. I think that that line does, in fact, capture exactly um, where his growth arc um, uh, goes to. Um, and I, I think, you know, it's an idea that's very familiar to us. Um, people who are ambitious, um, you know, politicians who, want, who, who create power um, think that they're in control of it. Uh, but at some point, the movement that they started overtakes them, uh, and and, and they, they lose the ability to really just direct things anymore, and they become essentially riders on a wild stallion, and, and, and wherever um, the movement goes, uh, wherever power takes them, they kind of have to go along. Uh, they're no longer in control of the situation. And I think that's kind of what happens to a lot of people as they rise in power. Yeah. And that seems to sort of tie in with the title, Grace of Kings. I don't know. Is there anything about the title you want to say? Um, sure. The Grace of Kings is actually an illusion. Uh, it's a quote from um, Henry V. Um, and so it's a, it's a phrase that's very rich with meaning. Um, the Grace of Kings can refer to um, all kinds of uh, uh, multiple reference. Uh, it may mean an, an exemplar of, of a king, um, or it might mean the mercy of a king, or it might mean the kind of... Um, special morality um, that kings have to exercise um, that mere commoners don't have to think about. Um, and, and the grace of kings is a phrase that recurs multiple times in the book, um, each time in a different kind of guise. Um, and it, it, it starts out as a very bright phrase, but then it becomes much darker near the end, um, where Kuni has to sort of make a decision um, whether the grace of kings, in the sense of this is what a king ought to do for the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people um, is, in fact, the right thing to do. And I heard you say, actually, that the, the working title was uh, The Dandelion and the Chrysanthemum. That's right. That was my working title at the time. Um, the Dandelion and the Chrysanthemum are 
uh, stand-ins for Kuni and Mata. Um, one of them is very pragmatic, um, sort of a weed, a uh, very useful kind of plant that's able to survive anywhere. And the other is this very proud, noble flower um, with a very strong, dominant personality, whether visually um, or in terms of fragrance. Um, and, and yet, the two of them are sort of similar, uh, as described in the book. They're both golden and they're both um, flowers where if you squint a little bit, a dandelion looks like a small chrysanthemum. Um, and so um, the, the, the flowers um, act as recurring symbols also to sort of show the characters of the two protagonists. Um, and so that particular line of floral imagery was also kept throughout the book as a recurring motif. Um, but as far as titles go, I think Chrysanthemum, the dandelion, doesn't quite work. Um, it doesn't tell people really what sort of book it is. Uh, and so I'm much happier with the, the, the actual title we ended up using. Although the, uh, the series as a whole is called The Dandelion Dynasty, so you did kind of keep a little bit of that in there. Yeah, at least I maintained um, uh, a little bit of that in there. Um, but again, I think the, the dandelion also is a symbol that transforms throughout the book um, and also even more so in the sequels. Um, so. Um, People should not, you know, think it means a certain thing. It uh, part of the the joy of the series, I think, is in the way these images get transformed over time. The book and the series as a whole is really about continuous revolution and um, the idea of constant dynamic change. Um, a lot of epic fantasy sort of, I think, falls into the the Lord of the Rings um, kind of yearning for a golden age of the past, a return to that past. Uh, the Grace of Kings is not like that. It's very much a story about the necessity for change in the city of revolution um, and uh, adapting to changed circumstances. Well, yeah, and speaking of those sorts of changes, why don't you tell us a bit about the character Mazzotti? So, Gin Mazzotti is kind of an interesting um, character. Um, she is added as an agent of change. Um, so, Early on, before you meet Gimazoti, um, this is a world in which, by custom, it is the men who do the fighting. Um, and, and so, because it's a novel about warfare, um, there's a huge amount of, of scenes and, and um, events where the only participants are men, uh, because the women are excluded from the battlefield. Um, and the book is very aware of this and sort of says, you know, multiple times, this is a matter of custom. This is the way it's set up. Um, women's roles are not in this sphere. Um, but then things sort of change uh, because Gia, um, Kuni's wife, sort of convinces him that when he's weak and he's not in power, um, he needs to leverage other sources of power, other individuals and other groups who also have been disenfranchised and, and disempowered by society. Um, it, the, the people who already have power in society are not going to help him because he wants to upset their, their gains. Uh, it's the people who don't have anything who will help him. And, you know, among these people, the most prominent are women. So Kim Zodi is one of these um, characters who ends up uh, coming into Kuni's service. And she uh, is a street urchin who grew up in the streets of a metropolis and who... Um, worked um, basically for a gang of thieves for a while and, and had this very uh, difficult sort of backstory where he, she was really not able to, um, to get a, a proper education. Um, and uh, fortunately, she comes into um, to be helped by a, a kinder uh, character, uh, a dock master who teaches her how to read and, and discovers that she actually has a talent for recognizing patterns and for thinking uh, in a strategic way about how to fit pieces together. Um, and it's this kind of big picture, strategic kind of thinking that ends up making Gin such a great general. She's not someone who, like Mata, is distinguished by prowess on the battlefield. She can fight, but you know, she's not ever going to be able to overcome in single combat um, somebody like Mata. Uh, she, she's, you know, she's not the ultimate fighter. That's not her thing. Um, but she, she shows that to be a great general, what you really need is leadership and, and the ability to think tactically and to use guile. And so those are the, her, the qualities I wanted to explore in her. Um, as I mentioned, the, the series and the book is about 
revolution and dynamism. So at the end of book one, you see that society of Dara has changed. A lot of the women characters uh, are playing very important roles um, because they have forced themselves into this, onto the stage uh, by helping a revolution, uh, leading a revolution that succeeded. Uh, and so they, 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 are now, they now have a stake uh, in the way uh, politics and military affairs are conducted. Um, but with every revolution, there always comes a backlash. Um, and so the book two is about how the backlash and, 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 and sort of uh, the way the revolution can continue. All people who are disempowered uh, in book one, the poor, uh, the uneducated, um, the women, uh, and all the people who have been, who are sort of either lost out on, on, on the revolution or who didn't gain as much uh, as they should have in the revolution or who um, just weren't being paid attention to in the revolution, they now want to continue the revolution. Uh, and it's a story about how an empire at peace um, needs to deal with these pressures. Um, and also there are surprises, which I won't mention here. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we're running a little short on time, and I did want to make sure to ask you about the the three body problem, which just uh, it was announced as a finalist for the Hugo Award. I uh, just want to say, like, what's your reaction to that? Uh, I think it's awesome. I'm I'm really glad to hear that. Um, you know, the three body problem, which is a uh, uh, one of the uh, first, and I think the only so far, uh, major hard sci-fi uh, novel by uh, a People's Republic of China author. Um, to, to be translated to English. Um, and then I think it's, it, it really shows how um, there is still a lot of love in the genre for the kind of core SF that Three Body Problem represents. This is a story about the wonder of, of the universe um, and, and, and then a very engineering-driven attitude towards um, the necessity for exploration, for, for understanding alien, uh, defining and understanding alien species and an idea of, of that our future is in the stars, not on this planet, uh, and not you know, in some uploaded future um, where we're just uh, disembodied uh, thought patterns in a machine. This is very much a novel that's oriented towards that ideal of, of, of striving um, to, to get off this rock and to, to, to go into space. Um, and it's just wonderful to see a, a translating a novel uh, with a very unique Chinese perspective on these um, core SF concerns uh, get such an enthusiastic reception here. Um, so I'm very pleased that the Three Body Problem has been nominated for Nebula as well as a Hugo. Um, I think before the Three Body Problem, only one other novel had been nominated for a Hugo. And I think um, also only one other novel had been nominated for Nebula. So uh, to me, it's also kind of, you know, history making. I think the last time those books were translated books were nominated like that it was uh like back in the 60s um so it's been many many years uh 60s and 70s so it's been many many decades now uh since a translated work has received such prominent um critical as well as popular attention so it's a very happy thing so if listeners are curious to learn more about chinese science fiction are there any good websites or things they should check out uh, well, they can certainly check out my website. I have a tab under translations, and, and they can uh, go there and look at all the translations I've done. I've done a lot of uh, short fiction translations from Chinese as well as novels, um, and so that would be a good place to go. All right, cool. So, yes, we're pretty much out of time here. So just uh, finally, uh, is there just anything else you want to mention in terms of projects, websites, uh, blog posts, just anything you want people to go check out? Sure. Um, my website is um, kenliu.name, so K-E-N-L-I-U dot N-A-M-E. I have a dot name domain uh, because, you know, I was being a good web citizen and believed that that's how you should do it and not go commercial. Anyway, so it, it's at least memorable. Um, and you can also follow me on Twitter at uh, K-Y-L-I-U 99. All right, great. So we've been speaking with Ken Liu about his new novel, The Grace of Kings. So, Ken, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, David. And that was our interview. So a big thanks again to Ken Liu for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to everyone who signed up this week to support us on Patreon, including Ren, Torstein Fishvik, Colin O'Neill, and Christina Perry. That brings our total up to $246.39 per episode. That means we just need another $3.61 in weekly pledges to hit our goal of $250 which will guarantee you that the show continues through the end of 2015. 
So that's another 30 or so new episodes, guaranteed. So if that's something you'd like to see happen, please head on over to patreon.com geeks and sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode. So we just need a handful of people to do that, and we'll be all set for the entire year. So once again, that's patreon.com geeks. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarrkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.